something is probably happening now. All right, we're up. So welcome everybody. Uh, help yourself. We got plenty of snacks for those of you who are local. For those of you who are remote, you'll have to pretend that you're eating the snacks, which is okay. Uh, I'm Doug Schmidt. It's kind of weird to be standing in front of a group of people who are live talking since. I spent most of the last three months talking in front of a, a camera with a green screen behind me. But it's, I think it's a little better this way. We're going to do a couple things today. Um, what I'd like to do first is kind of tell you a little bit about how we made this course and, and some of the lessons that we've learned so far, and then just open it up to whatever people feel like discussing. Hopefully, we'll also be joined by people who are connecting in remotely. Uh, this is a big, grand experiment in virtual office hours throughout the world and uh, sort of a bigger experiment in the democratization of higher education, which is kind of cool. So let's take a look and see if we can show the slides. I don't know whether I go to full screen mode. Katie, can you let me know if you're seeing the slides? OK, great. Now, it's my understanding that what we're presenting here will also be recorded, is that right, and archived. So if people uh, want to come back later and look at the material in more detail, that will be available. Hopefully, people remotely can hear what I'm saying. Um, we'll also be monitoring the discussion forum. So if you want to type questions or something as we're talking, we'll do that. So as you guys probably know, uh, Vanderbilt's been involved in, in digital learning actually for quite a long time. It just hasn't become part of the mainstream in our educational um, outreach until very recently. We began in earnest at the very end of the summer, a group of us getting together, talking about what might transpire as we moved into this brave new world. On September 19th, we made an official announcement that Vanderbilt was going to be doing a number of Coursera courses, uh, focusing on five topics to begin with. We're focusing on the uh, uh, strategic innovation with Dave Owens. We have a course by Jamie Pope on lifestyle nutrition, my course on patterns and frameworks, which hopefully everybody's aware of. And we also have a course, two more courses. Uh, Jay Clayton's talking about uh, kind of the role of online gaming as a way to demonstrate narrative and uh, literature and getting people excited to be part of, of an ancient tradition of storytelling and being involved as communities. And then there's another course on kind of data, data research management, which is being done by Paul Harris and his group in the medical school. What I'd like to do is just talk a little bit at the beginning about what we've been doing here, some of my experience so far. We also have other folks like uh, Professor Doug Fisher, who's here, who's been doing a really interesting job with blended learning over the past uh, couple of years, taking Coursera and other digital learning material and using it in his face-to-face -face classroom. I personally think we're going to see a lot more of this as we go forward. Uh, as you all know, I've been doing my class now for a week, which makes me almost an old timer when it comes to uh, d MOOCs and digital learning. Uh, I won't go through what the course is about. Hopefully, you, you figured it out by watching the videos so far. What I do want to say is a couple things about what the course is doing in terms of its involvement with face-to-face with -face education at Vanderbilt. So I've been teaching a number of courses here for 10 years or so that relate to the topics we're covering in the class. But, but no any single course is what we cover. So this is a combination of, of an Android systems programming course that I teach at Vanderbilt, a course on software design patterns that some of you have taken here before or some of you will take, and another course I've taught in the past on advanced software design of network systems. And uh, all these things kind of came together to form the basis for this class. I am actually using the material we produced for this Coursera course in my face-to-face -face class, which started a couple months ago. And as the material has been produced and released, the students are using it. Uh, a lot of them are very happy because they don't have to come to class. They have to come to class, but they don't have to understand everything I say. They can go back and watch the material at their own pace, at their own rate. We'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later. Here's a couple of interesting factoids. What am I doing? You guys can't see what I'm doing. That doesn't help. Uh, here, let's make it a lot more interesting for the people in the room. Uh, that will be more interesting here, hopefully. So here's a few interesting factoids about this class. So. I ended up creating about 1,200 slides. Uh, I had some of the bits and pieces before, but they had never been organized anywhere nearly as comprehensively and, and in terms of little sections, each of which is 15 to 20 minutes long. I didn't have all the bells and whistles that we have now for this course. So, so the act of producing this material has helped create much better content. 
and we'll talk a bit later about how that's going to help a lot of things. About 20 hours worth of video. We probably shot maybe about 30 hours worth of stuff, 30 hours of filming. We were pretty lucky that we got a lot of the stuff right on the first take. Um, a lot of post-production has taken place. We have over 80 videos. That's a lot of things to keep track of. Uh, two months of filming. We had about 30,000 people in the course when it started a week ago. I think it's almost up to 32,000 now, so people keep coming in. And one of the things that I think is really exciting is uh, we've had over 800 people or 800 posts so far in the last week on the online discussion forum. And this has been really exciting. If you take a look at the statistics, and we can take a look at some of the statistics later, there, there are literally people from all around the world involved here, uh, people with all kinds of different background, all different levels of, of ability, but everybody is very eager and interested in learning. And there's been some kind of cool little human interest stories, people who you know, are making some sacrifices in order to get the videos downloaded in their, in their country where they have very low bandwidth and they have to pay a fairly large amount of money to download these big videos. But they, they feel compelled to, to learn the material. <clears throat> As I think I mentioned before, it would take me 600 years to reach this many people in my traditional courses. I teach about 50 students a year for the past uh, 20 years. That's about 1,000 students. So 30 plus 1,000 students, that's about 600 years. Uh, other people, like David Owens, it's probably more like you know 1,000 years worth of students. So he's done a great job with his as well. It's been a team effort. We had a lot of people helping out. Obviously, there's a lot of support from the, the institution. Had people who helped out filming the videos, producing the videos. And we all got a lot smarter about how to do this. Growing that organic resource, I think, is important for Vanderbilt going forward, as people like Jay will discover very shortly. Um, here are some lessons I learned from creating the, the course. As I said before, when I give a traditional class, I have a deck of slides. There's probably three or 400 slides. We start at the beginning of the course, and we wander around to the course for some period of time. And when 14 weeks are up, we're done. And you know, if we get to the end of the slides, that's great. If we don't, that's OK, too. Uh, you cannot possibly teach a Coursera course like that. You've got to keep the topics really short and to the point. You have to organize things hierarchically. I spent a lot of time trying to organize the material so it could fit into small groups without losing the overall themes that are going on. The other big issue, and I've learned a lot of lessons about this one, even in the first week, when I teach a course here at Vanderbilt, I have a pretty good idea what the students know. They, they, by the time they get to most of my classes, they know how to program in C++. They know how to program in Java. They have some experience with data structures, some experience with algorithms, uh, maybe some operating system experience. Depends on which course it is. I have no idea who's, who's out there for the Coursera course. And that made some, some interesting design choices. So I actually recorded a lot more introductory material than I normally would have ever done for a Vanderbilt course. And that's been a, both a blessing and a curse. The, the good part is that people of all backgrounds and abilities have an ability to come up to speed on the topics at their own pace. The downside has been that there's people who are more advanced who are a little bored with the first weeks of material. So luckily, we got through it in a week. I think one of the lessons I've learned is doing the course next time, I'll probably make the background material optional. And that way, people won't be tempted to you know, have to slog through it if they already feel that they have a mastery of the topics. What I would probably do instead is start right away with the, the real meat of the course, which we're getting to this week and henceforth, uh, and make this other material just optional for them to look at or move it to the appendix or something like that. Uh, I'm a big fan of a visual metaphor to convey technical ideas. That's also kind of interesting. Uh, I tend to think like that. Not all students think of like things like that. A lot of people feel much more comfortable understanding code. There will be lots of code that we're going to get to here very shortly. The introductory material was, was kind of more metaphoric in some ways. Some people liked that. Some people didn't. They felt, they felt a little bit antsy. They're not familiar. Another problem is the, the metaphors that we choose to use might make sense to us in our you know, American-centric view of the world or the kind of world we travel in. Maybe very, very limited um, appeal to anybody else, right? So you know, a cloverleaf traffic circle pattern uh, may not mean anything to somebody who doesn't come from a place like that. Uh, this picture, one of the pictures up here is actually from China. So they have traffic circles there as well, but not everybody lives in a big city. So some of the metaphors are, are a bit of a stretch. I'm looking forward to getting feedback from the students in the course on how to better tailor the metaphors in a more culturally appropriate way. Um, here's one that my Indian friends can relate to. This is, this is the metaphor for congestion. 
It's an Indian street scene with lots of uh, cars. I was in India a couple years ago, and it looked just like that. It was very confusing. Um, one of my favorite images I use over and over again to show multi-core processors. So you can see multiple cores, right? Multiple Apple cores. Uh, we were permit we were not permitted to use copyrighted images in our material, so we had to kind of go far afield. Another great kind of cross-cultural example. This is supposed to show um, replication as a means of fault tolerance. So this is the famous terracotta warriors in China. And uh, hopefully people can recognize that if they've, they've been exposed to that. But the idea there is there's no single point of failure. You, you can bring all your, your army of terracotta warriors to you in the afterlife. And if one of them fails, you've got plenty of other ones to replicate. Creating a course like this is a lot different from doing a normal course. Um, when I talk to you guys, I get some sort of feedback. You know, it's either there's sometimes it's hard to disambiguate the feedback. This is two things. This is the I'm really bored look because you're going so slow. Um, and this is the I'm really confused look because you're going too fast. They look very similar. But at least you get feedback. Uh, when you're in the Coursera environment filming the course, you're standing in front of a green screen. You're looking at a camera. You have to be able to establish rapport with that piece of uh, plastic and metal, which is not easy, uh, especially if you do this day in and day out. One of the things I tried very hard to do was you know, make it look like I was talking to you, the, the audience, as I was doing the filming. And that's a little bit weird. You have to get into that mode. Um, there's lots of other things people do. That's not the only way to do a course. That was something I tried very hard to do. I also worked really hard. One of the things that I spent most of my time doing, I would prepare the material. Then the night before, I would go through it all and kind of you know, really make sure all the things made sense to me at a high level. And then the morning of the shoot, I would go down before we opened the studio, and I would sit there and I would practice in my head the transitions for the course. Because I wanted to be able to just sort of talk to the camera and just have the slides change in the background. Um, sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. One of the other interesting things I learned was that you can go back, as I'll talk about here, and do post-production. So there were times when I didn't quite get the transitions right, but through the magic of tools like, like uh, uh, screen, screen capture, screen flow, and other things, you can go back and edit your, your uh, slides and do all kinds of amazing things to them that you really wouldn't have been able to do just by clicking a clicker. So you'll see some of the later slides are heavily post-produced to give a kind of a magic Disney-like feel to them. The other thing I had a really hard time remembering to do was to smile. Uh, you're sitting there, and you're looking at this silly camera, and you know, you're trying to remember what to say, and it's a lot of pressure, and then you've got to like, look happy at the same time. That was very tough. Here are some observations from my vast experience giving a MOOC the past week. So, this course is a design course. It's a software design course, ultimately. That's not to say there's not lots of programming-related topics there. But it's not a course that's just about how do you write code. We'll get to code, and writing code is important. But really, the essence is design. And one of the things that you very quickly realize is the challenges of trying to do a design course in this type of environment. Because there's only a few tools at your disposal to assess people. And I'll get to the assessment part in a second. So you can do quizzes, which are basically multiple choice, true, false kinds of things. And we do those, but they're not really very satisfying, honestly. They don't really probe in any detail. Uh, you can give people essay questions and have them peer graded. Um, essay questions for computer programmers are something like story problems for people who don't like math, right? They're sort of torture. And people like I, if I'd wanted to be a, if I'd wanted to write essays, I would have been an English major. I wouldn't have been a computer programmer, darn it. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, people are doing a pretty good job, but it's, it's obviously not something programmers are looking forward to do as much. So what do you do? Well, I can have people write code, and we're going to write code. But then the question is, how do you assess the code? So it's not as simple as it would be if you're doing a CS 101 style course, where you write little program snippets, and you submit them, and they get compiled, and you run to compute you know, like the, the, a factorial or something like that. You get a specific number. We're trying to talk about how do you write well-designed software. Now, the way we do that here at Vanderbilt is that in the courses I teach, the design courses, my students submit their programs to me, and I look through them all by hand, and I give them specific comments on how to improve their design and their programming. And that's pretty cool. People really like that. Very few courses give you kind of that kind of feedback. Try doing that for 50 students. That's starting to push the envelope of what you can successfully do manually. How to do that for 30,000 students. It's, it's impossible. You spend the rest of your life trying to come up the code. So we're, we're trying to use some peer assessment 
techniques, peer grading, knowing that that's going to be suboptimal, right? Because the people who are doing the assessment may themselves may not be yet complete experts on this. And so we're asking them to assess each other. So this is still a work in progress. It's much more difficult to, to assess people's understanding of a pattern language, which is the funny thing that's at the top of the screen, compared to a programming language where you can compile it and it's got syntax and semantics and so on. That's something I think um, additional research is needed on how to do assessment of design courses. We already see this at Coursera. Things like chemistry or biology with labs don't really lend themselves to MOOCs. I personally think down the road as we get further into this as an institution, as, as the community of higher education starts to embrace MOOCs and digital learning more thoroughly, what you'll see is that stuff that lends itself to auto grading will be MOOCified very quickly. People will use those things. That'll be, you know, the, the 101 style courses in almost any major that are, lend themselves to auto grading will be MOOCified. And what professors like us will do is, you know, to use a business term, retreat up market. We will be teaching the courses that are not easy to MOOCify. We'll be teaching the courses where there's something that really requires human deep interaction to give feedback. Just a speculation. One of the most fun things that I've had with the course so far is the discussion forum. It's been extremely active, a lot of people asking questions. Uh, the, first, the first couple of days were sort of a, a, quite an interesting shock for me. A lot of good comments came back right away. Um, you very quickly learn that the people who take this course from a Coursera audience point of view are quite different from traditional students. Many of them have real jobs. Uh, most of them would like to be able to work in off hours. One of the requests that came in right away was, please put the material out sooner. You know, don't wait till Monday to release it. Release it Friday so we can watch it over the weekend. Right? That makes sense. So that was a quick adaptation. Um, lots and lots of other comments. We, we've tried very hard to be responsive to give people what they need as quickly as we can. A lot of help from the community in terms of crowdsourcing. So my slides have lots of URLs in them. That's a way for me to provide like a footnote to where you can learn more about whatever it is I'm talking about. And uh, I had thought, I'll, at some point, I'll go back and extract those things out sometime. Well, what we had, Dave, do you mind letting me know? One of the things that uh, some very nice people in the class did is they first went through and manually extracted all the slides and put them up on the course wiki. And then some really clever person wrote a Visual Basic script to automatically extract URLs out of the slides. So now, when the material goes up, boom, they put the stuff on the wiki. We've crowdsourced the solution. I've also got tremendous help fixing typos, uh, ambiguous questions in quizzes are quickly detected and we correct them, uh, broken links, you know, anything that goes wrong, the early adopters quickly discover, we fix it, usually by the time the bulk of the people show up, it's already been fixed. So crowdsourcing has been great for improving the quality. Uh, a lot of people out there taking the course are quite experienced, they have a lot of interesting things to share. Some of the early material had a bit of a philosophical bent to it, talking about the effects of commoditization. Commoditization is basically a phenomenon where you end up with indistinguishable supplies of stuff to where you compete largely just on price or availability or, or whatever. Um, coffee or oil is like that. You don't really care where you buy your oil from. It's a commodity. Um, one of the things that's happening through online learning, like Coursera, is a potential for a commoditization or disintermediation of the higher education profession. And uh, a lot of the people taking this course online, this is like their, their 12th Coursera course. And they have a lot of really interesting things to share about what this means for them and how it affects what they do, what they like, what they don't, how they see it changing the landscape. And I see the whole thing as incredibly disruptive. We'll talk more about that in a second. But it's been great to hear from people who've been there for quite some time, given that it's only been around for about a year, right? People on their, their 12th course. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that really surprised me. Lots of interest in the grading policy. So when I first started out, I thought, you know, this isn't a real course in the sense of a Vanderbilt stock course. We're not really scrutinizing these assignments in quite the same way we do here at Vanderbilt. I don't look at every line of code and give people detailed comments. People would just show up and just watch the videos and hang out and chit chat on the discussion boards and we'll have kind of a fun forum. The first, if you go back and were to do an archaeological analysis or a textual analysis of the first couple of days worth of discussion board topics, they were all about What's the grading scheme? How do I get a statement of accomplishment? And so on. And, and, and it took me about 10 seconds to realize that this is a very fascinating phenomenon. People really look at this as something meaningful. 
the statement of accomplishment that they get is worthy of, of currency in the world in which they're trying to use them, which is, which is really cool. Um, so we quickly started to think, you know, how can we make sure the course has some substance to it um, while still meeting the fact that people have you know, real lives they have to do. So that, that's an ongoing, an ongoing evolution, and it's not one that's perfected at this point, but it's been quite fascinating to see how people really, really want to do work in these classes. They're not just like there to, to chit chat. It's not like a coffee club. It's not like a book club, right? It's something where people really want feedback, and, and we're adding more of that. I think if we do this course, or when we do this course in the future, we'll have a lot more time to sit back and, and figure out how to do that right. A couple observations on the platform. So uh, it's been fairly easy to learn how to use the Coursera platform from a teacher point of view. There's some clunkiness to it. Um, uploading of videos is a little bit wacky, some things that are a little bit hard um, to do. But that's, that's all been manageable. And we've got fantastic support from the folks at uh, at Coursera, Ryan George and other people have done a great job of, of helping us out along the way. Some of the things for the students is, are a little bit tricky. They, they don't always have an easy way of being able to get a bird's eye view of all the different assignments that they have that are due of different types of assignments. So there's, there's standalone quizzes, there's programming assignments, there are essay questions, peer graded stuff, and it's no one place you can go to see the whole kit and caboodle. And that's a little bit frustrating to people. That's stuff that, of course, will be worked on over time. Um, some platforms are not as well supported as you might want. Uh, we've been having various bug reports. Uh, people who watch the videos on Android, there's some problems where all the quizzes show up in, in like a big mass at the beginning or the end, which is confusing, as you might expect. Um, some browsers do a little bit of goopy things. Though some of those are easy to fix, some of them are hard. I think if you stick with Chrome on a laptop, <laughs> like, a, like a Windows laptop, you're fine. Other things, you start deviating too far, and it's a little hard to get stuff to work. One of the things that I would like to have fixed is there's no support for so-called permalinks. So if you go into a discussion forum, and you know, in the first couple of days this wasn't a problem because there was only a couple questions or a couple of discussions, you start getting really long discussions going on. There's no easy way to get a link to an individual piece of a discussion. You can only go to the top level and say, you know, this is the topic on, uh, you know, is Corbett dead or whatever. And uh, down below, you have to then scroll, 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 scroll to find what you're looking for. That makes it much more difficult for me to keep track of what's going on as an instructor because I can't just you know say boom. I can't send an email to, to Zach, my TA, and say hey, this is this is broken. Go fix it. I have to sort of tell him where it is. That's a little bit confusing. Um, other things. This is kind of weird. If if you respond to a post, it doesn't really show up that there's been a new response. So it's kind of hard to track when new things show up. It's a little bit odd. But overall, it's, it's fine. And considering that it's free, uh, it's, it's pretty darn good value. So to kind of conclude this stuff, and then we can talk about other things and get questions from the, the audience, both virtually and locally, um, I see what's happening here as a playing out of what Thomas Friedman calls the triple convergence. So if you read his classic book, The World is Flat, he talks about the triple convergence of technology evolution business processes and workforce, right? And this is the convergence of those three things, right? So we've got the technology in place, we've got high-speed networks most places, most people have access to computing devices with high-resolution screens, most people have access to browsers that work for the Coursera platform, so that's there. Uh, we can record the videos now relatively inexpensively, it doesn't cost a fortune to make these things. Um, that's actually going to get even easier over time, very quickly, I think. Um, there's a workforce out there that wants to be educated, that is very, very eager to learn. Um, and it's all over the world, literally, so that's a piece. And there's business processes at work. There's a lot of money to be made here. Um, the process of disintermediating higher education is going to make somebody, or some people, a lot of money. <laughs> Not necessarily clear who it's going to be, but it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes out. So these are three things that are coming together as a confluence and uh, very, very disruptive. You can just feel it when you watch the discussions on the message boards. I've always believed it's much better to to surf the tsunami than get left behind by it or get crushed by it, right? You've got to find just the right place to be. And that's one reason why folks like me and Jay and Dave Owens and other people are doing this. Um, I, I see digital learning transforming higher education very quickly. Uh, I, I like to joke about MOOC years. So you, know, you have dog years and cat years. I think we have MOOC years where things are happening really fast. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next six months to two years, there's going to be a radical shakeout 
in, in the field of higher ed. Um, some people are well positioned for this. I think Vanderbilt's done a very good job at being what I would call a fast follower, right? We are not Stanford. We didn't come up with a lot of this stuff or other places, MIT, Berkeley, wherever you want to put as the, the founders of this. Um, but we've responded very quickly. We're building organic expertise. We're getting ourselves out in the community being involved. There are a lot of places also, and, and it's absolutely fascinating to watch this unfold. And maybe Doug can talk about this later. There are a lot of places out there that are basically taking the ostrich approach. You know, this is not going to affect us. This is a flash in the pan. It's a fad. It'll just blow over. Um, that's probably a very dangerous place to be. Because even if you decide that this is not where your money comes from in terms of a revenue model, you've got to figure out what it's going to do to your brand, to people understanding what it is that you do. One of the things you see a lot of discussed in the message forum, which I don't think is quite practical yet, but people are enamored by it, you know, is it just getting rid of the institutions altogether. And you'll have, you know, basically the equivalent of like Dave Ramsey. Anybody here know Dave Ramsey? He's a radio personality that talks about finance, right? So he's got his own Dave Ramsey University. You can get your degree from Dave Ramsey University. Um, you know, will professors become the, 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 you know, Howard Stern or Dave Ramsey type, type of people? Will they have large followings that will follow them wherever they go? I think there's some big problems with that model, by the way. But it's interesting to see what's happening here. And you've got to be doing it to understand where it's going, or at least to have some informed insight. I, I can't wait till the next time we get together in a higher ed environment, because I want to ask a couple questions. I want to ask people, how many people here have an opinion about digital learning and MOOCs? And I'll bet everybody's hands will raise. So I have one. How many people here have ever taken a MOOC? A few people. How many people have ever taught a MOOC? Hardly anybody, right? So we've all got these opinions that are shaped from stuff that's really not founded in anything very data driven, right? You know, and, and the feedback I'm getting from the people in the course, and, and I will avail myself of their feedback as soon as I have more time, is they said, take take a bunch of classes. See what's happening. See what works, see what doesn't, see how the learning communities are building up. That's how you get the insight as to what's really going on. And so that's when I started looking at that, I was like, they're right. You know, this is this is a transformational thing. You can't watch it passively from the sidelines. You've got to get involved and do it. Thomas Friedman, who's uh, a very controversial person, but I think it, you know, a lot of people don't like Thomas Friedman because they don't like the message he conveys, and they also don't like who they think he represents. But he's been pretty good at, at a, as, as a prognosticator. <laughs> uh, so you may dislike him, you may dislike his uh, economic views, but he's also been pretty right. And he has a nice quote here about big breakthroughs often happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And I think one of the things we do not appreciate enough here in our wonderful world of the Vandy bubble and the Nashville area is that um, you know, we take this for granted an awful lot of times, the access to, to excellent education. But a lot of other people in the world do not. And they are absolutely tickled pink to be able to get access to the kind of quality education that they're getting. And they're going to use it and learn from it and evolve it in all kinds of interesting ways. Those are just some of the things I want to talk about. Um, Let's switch back over here out of screen share mode into person mode um, and see if anybody has any things they want to talk about. And I don't have to lecture, by the way. I can sit down and have a chat. I'm just standing here because then they can see me. Um, and also, Katie, can we see if anybody had any questions? Not yet. No questions. Okay. You know, though. Okay. I guess the big question is we don't know if anybody's actually on the other end of this broadcast, right? There's some people. Hello. So I had a question about the discussion board. Uh, yeah. Sort of a late starter on the lectures. By the time I got to the discussion board, there were, as you said, something like 300 posts. Yep. And I'm wondering if there's going to be two different populations, uh, those that ask and those that Work. read and those that get overwhelmed. Um, is, there any, is there any work on the, on the horizon that you know of in which, uh, I don't know, to make those discussion boards more uh, yeah, yeah. More, uh, but, but also to give people that are late covers an actual opportunity to formulate questions themselves because that's sort of a skill. That's an excellent, excellent point. If, if I had more time, what I would like to have done, uh, and I will probably do this after the class is over when I have more time, I'd really like to call through the message board and start extracting out commonly asked questions. I did that a little bit, but I just got, got overwhelmed with the sheer volume and start building a really nicely cataloged fact. One nice thing is you, the search capabilities are great, so you can find stuff very easily. But what really needs to go there is a, is a fact, because people have asked the same question 
in slight variance about 500 times. And you know, I, I patiently answer those questions because I think it's important that people have a, a feeling of personal involvement, more like a real class. Um, but a lot of these things could easily be addressed by just saying, you know, go look here, you know, and, and, and that would be a way to address it. So that's part of it. You know, reorganize. There, there's certain things that show up all over the place. Um, what is the course grading policy? There's a whole discussion on that. Um, you know, what, are, what about programming assignments? How are we going to do programming assignments? How is peer assessment going to work? That kind of stuff. Very similar questions over and over again. Um, luckily, a lot of the students now start answering the questions, and you take advantage of the crowdsourcing there. Yes, ma'am. And say, put it here, and then they'll do it themselves. Yep. Great, great point. So those who are listening online, I'll repeat these questions because you probably can't hear them because uh, the microphone's right here. Um, so there's a wiki. One of the things you have at Coursera is a course wiki. In fact, maybe I can even show my screen and show you guys what these things are that I'm talking about. So let's see. All right. So this is this is the this is the instructor's view. Or the you know the course staff's view of things back behind the scenes, and lots of cool stuff. This is how I publish the videos. You can see some things are published. You can say when they're going to be published. You can do all kinds of other things. You can put the quizzes in here and so on and so forth. Um, and then you can also go over here and go to various. This is the this is the view that the students see, and one of the things is the course wiki. So here's the course wiki, and as you can see, the great thing that was done by crowdsourcing, all the URLs from all the slide sets organized by week which is very helpful for the students. And then other people would go through, for example, um, I think there were some things like, here are some terms. I used the word commoditization. That term is not familiar to a lot of people. So some good Samaritans took it upon themselves to, to copy down common things I said and put them up there. So that's a great idea, to be able to actually say, you know, Go and let's start as a community building a wiki so other people can learn and navigate that. And that's a great crowdsourcing technique. So thank you. I think I will, I will suggest that and see how much we can get. Um, the other thing I'm really, really hoping to get from crowdsourcing is to take the lecture material that I'm producing, which is you know, necessarily um, based on what I actually know about. Right. So I'm, I'm a person with programming experience in C++. I'm a person with programming experience in Java. Um, but I'm not a person with programming experience in other languages, Objective-C, Python, and so on. But the course material I'm teaching is probably 98% applicable to all those other languages. So I'd love to have students in the course, as those slides become available, and I'm putting them all out in PowerPoint form, take the material that's in C++ and Java and port it as a community to their favorite languages. So then all of a sudden, the patterns, which are really the key theme of the course, could be accessible to people with other language backgrounds. It would be also great, speaking of languages, if people would translate the slides into other languages, right? You could translate them into other Spanish or, or Mandarin or so on. Um, one of the cool things that Coursera does, and it happens in a blink of an eye, if you are an instructor, this is, this is really cool. Take a look at this. So I come over here. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get that website up again. Oh, well, we can navigate there as long as I can. Get here. I think that's sharing, maybe. So I go over here, and now I'm into screen show mode, and, and I've I've done everything here, so I don't have to can't really show you how it worked. But when you up, once you upload a video, you just click ready for captioning, hit save, and in about 12 hours to 24 hours, this the captions, the the translation and the, the, the transcription of your words show up in text format, and when you play the videos back. It's just like watching you know, a, a French movie or a foreign language movie. It has the, the subtitles underneath of what you're saying. And then at some point, if, if the course is popular enough, people will come along and then crowdsource the translation into different languages. right? So there would be the Spanish version of the subtitles, which I think is just the coolest thing imaginable. Because I, I love to do lots of things, but I'm probably not going to learn Mandarin in my lifetime, you know, despite the fact it would be great to have the time to do that. So that's the power of crowdsourcing again. So you give a good example. There are other ones as well. Yes, sir. I think it would be pretty cool, like, for the assignments that are coming up. For instance, like myself, uh, I've been out of college since 2007, and I've got a master's degree. I haven't done C++ plus plus way back then. But since 05, I've been developing on the dot net platform. Yep. This is just three dollars just to start. So the, 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 course, the, the material that you put out, if, if some people use um, you know, C sharp or C++, 
plus maybe we could have assignments and go into different categories and people will grade them to different levels. That's so to the uh, here's the comment and it's a great comment. So when we start doing programming assignments, and we may start actually doing a, a, a small one very quickly to do exactly what you're talking about, the, the uh, recommendation was um, have them put up on the website in a way that people with different language uh, skills could peer grade each other's assignments. So you could have the assignment and then say, write the solution in C Sharp, write the solution in Python, write the solution in Java, write the solution in C++. And then people with those skills would form their own communities to peer grade each other's assignments and if conceivably they would know how to write those languages and how to evaluate them. I think that's a really good idea. In fact, we're, we're going to meet tomorrow to talk about putting up a very simple multi-threading assignment and we'll probably put it up in three or four languages just to, to experiment to see if we can do that. The, the Coursera platform doesn't really support that per se, but I think we can tweak what they do support, which is, you know, we just have the assignments replicated. There would be four assignments and they'd be in different languages and different people would peer-evaluate peer based on that. That's a really good idea. That's also one of the most common questions I get, um, which is, you know, I want to do the assignments, but I want to do them in X, where X is their favorite language. And my response is, you know, C and C++ are the ones we're doing. If you can find other people in your community to help out, let's go for it. I think that's great. You know, getting back to the technical topic of the course, it's about design patterns and how design patterns can be used to make you a more effective software designer. And one of the key themes in design patterns is to be independent of the programming language as much as possible or maybe a better way to put it, to use patterns that make sense in whatever technology platform or language you happen to use, which might be platform independent or it might not, but you're using things that are well established for best practices for people in that community of interest. So if we can get more of that, I think it's a great idea. Yes, sir. Obviously, obviously courses about patterns. Um, I work at the application level. Yep. So I'm wondering if the patterns that we go over will be transferable to that layer I'm how to learn yeah, good question. Some of, some of the things, and, and actually that's one reason why I did a lot of these appendices and other types of stuff. So there's a whole set of slides which were just put out or we just begun to put out on the gang of four patterns. Those are all application style patterns, right? Um, and I, I recorded those slides for, for two reasons. Number one, I wanted to use them in my course this semester. So uh, the course I'm teaching here face-to-face -face, will use those as a flipped classroom-like model and I needed the material. Um, secondly, well, actually three reasons. The other reason is everybody who does patterns likes to learn about gang four patterns because it's kind of the beginning point. But also it addresses your, your issue. If you're doing application level stuff, for sure you're going to run into situations where adapters come in handy, bridge, proxy. I mean, there's just a whole gaggle of stuff in there, observer, that, that you'll use right off the bat. The next set of lectures that goes up this Friday, probably, because uh, we're putting them up on before the weekend, will be an overview of Gang of Four and POSA One patterns. And these are these are fundamentally you know, observer, proxy, broker, and um, command, right? So those are all patterns that application developers either will use directly or they will use on top of something. Um, later patterns we talk about, which are more concurrency patterns, some of those are things you would use an application developer. As a good example, one of my favorite examples, the half sync, half async pattern, which is a very common pattern for structuring concurrency in operating systems, middleware, you know, graphic user interface environments. And you get a little, little taste of that in this week's uh, videos on, on Android, uh, where we talk about how Android basically works as follows. Uh, in Android, the user interface thread can never block for any length of time. So it's, it's single-threaded you know, rendering and display of things to widgets on the screen. So what do you do if you have a long-running computation? Well, you can't really do it in the main thread of control. So what do you do? You spawn a thread or threads that run in the background, and they do computation. And when they're done, there's a very cool little mechanism to be able to take the results and then get it back to the main thread of control. And there's a variety of ways to do it. I illustrate some stuff using um, uh, messages and handlers and runnables, and there's a whole pile of things. Turns out that way of architecting the solution is essentially the half sync, half async pattern. Now, the half sync, half async pattern will get covered many, many different times in the course from many different points of view. Um, sometimes we'll look at it from an infrastructure point of view. Sometimes we we'll look at it from an applications point of view. But it rises up to the level of application developer very quickly. So I'd say it, it's kind of half and half. Um, other things are things that, as an application developer, you might use, but for infrastructural purposes. So for example, we'll talk a lot about the 
um, various factory patterns. Applications use factories galore to make stuff. We'll be talking about strategy and template method, which are ways of being able to defer certain steps in an algorithm to later in the design cycle where you have more information about how to customize things. We'll be talking about patterns like component configurator that allow us to dynamically link in in plug-in-like fashion capabilities, objects, plugins, widgets, and so on. So a lot of those things are usable for applications um, beyond the infrastructure stuff. And then there's a whole huge section on uh, patterns for writing high-performance servers. And I use web server just to make it more fun. But we look at the key thing there is the concept of a pattern language. So we look at about eight different ways of arranging patterns to implement different kinds of concurrency. Um, mostly in a server context, clients might have some of this, but as you know, you know, people tend to sweat a lot less about client multi-threading than they do about server multi-threading and concurrency. So we'll look at a lot of stuff. Many of those things will be very much applicable broadly. Katie? Do you have any forum questions? There's a question. All right. Yay. All right. So the question is, are we going to learn to use statistic framework since integration, as you said, seems to be the skill of this research? Yes, so we are going to, as, as described in a number of, so the question, the question was, uh, are we going to learn specific frameworks? And the answer is yes, um, and we're going to do it as follows. If you take a look at the course overview slide, uh, lectures, it talks about what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be focusing on Android, which is in Java, and the framework, some of the frameworks that Android provides, the framework components that Android provides, things like activities, services, content providers and broadcast receivers. And we'll be going, going through a bunch of examples in Java showing how you implement various things using those components and the patterns, more importantly, the patterns that they embody. But it'll be very, very specific and detailed. And we'll also be using ACE, which is largely in C++ or all in C++ for our purposes. The reason by, for choosing ACE and choosing Android several fold, which is also described in the videos, number one, they're open source. So we can talk about them, and you can also play with them. They're freely available. You can look at all the pieces and so on. And both of those frameworks, or, or frameworks of frameworks in some cases, are also pattern-oriented. Patterns were explicitly used in their design. Uh, ACE is very heavily pattern-oriented for obvious reasons, because I was heavily involved in it, so I know a lot about the patterns. Android is also extremely pattern-oriented. And so what's cool is, as we learn about the patterns, you'll be able to see how those things manifest themselves in production strength stuff. Now, having said that, once again, I would love nothing more than to have people take the material that we use in ACE and Android and then port it to iOS or port it to Boost or port it to other platforms that would be different and broader in scope and so on. There are lots of other environments that work in somewhat similar ways, you know, Java.net uh, or .NET or Java J2EE uh, types of environments. And what you'll find is the patterns are all almost always the same. They just have different incarnations. They're not always identical, but they're very similar. Yeah? Um, should we, um, yeah, in order to be ready to work with the pattern, um, should we go ahead and get an environment up and running with Ace and uh, Android so that we'll be ready to go? Probably not a bad idea. Again, I wanted to choose one thing that would be C++, one thing that would be Java, just to give people the broadest scope. I had, the, the question was, should people, should people start to prepare by getting a little accustomed to an environment, like install Ace or install Android? The answer is probably not a bad idea, especially if that's related to the day job that you do. Uh, I originally had wanted to film the videos where there would be a video that would just talk about patterns qua patterns, patterns as design. And then you as the audience, um, kind of like those movies like Run, Lola, Run or something, you, know, you have different paths you can go down. So if you wanted the C++ variant, you would then watch the videos that showed how those patterns were realized in C++. You would watch the patterns that were realized in Java. And then later, I could record them in other languages. Daphne Kohler warned me that was going to be a hard thing. Doug, Doug Fisher and I had dinner with her six months ago. And I told her this vision. She said, that's too much work. And she was right. Uh, so we didn't quite get that far. But that was the goal. So what we're doing now is there'll be C++ stuff. And then I'll show Java examples of things. But um, yeah, especially if, you know, if you're a Java programmer, you get Eclipse. Um, actually, if you're a Java programmer and want to play around with Android, uh, in some of the videos, I talk about a course I teach here at Vanderbilt called CS282. And if you go take a look at the website, all the slides are available there. And there's a couple slide sets that talk about 
how to install Android on Eclipse. <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit of a black art, but uh, I figured it out. And I was very proud of myself because I'm a C++ developer. Um, but I figured it out. It's, it's wonderful. I've had so much fun learning Java, learning Android. So many of the patterns that we talk about in this course and other courses are just everywhere in Android. So it's just a, a pattern, pattern cornucopia, um, which is really cool. So if, if that's what you're doing, do that. I know that there are people out there who are more C++ or Ace oriented. You know, Ace would be a good thing to install. And in both cases, there's large user communities who can help out. Another question? Another question. Great. It's in the patterns. Okay. So why did you use a beehive image as a metaphor for this course? Ah, great question. The question is why do we use a beehive as the metaphor? And I should probably show you what the thing is referring to. Let's see, we can go find the website somewhere. So if you go to the, let's go to the original website. Um, Coursera, course, Hosa. There we go. So that's, that's the original image. Um, when I think about concurrent processing of independent agents that are working together in some kind of coordinated fashion, yet each running autonomously, right? When I think of concurrency, I think of bees in a hive, right? That just kind of comes to mind as a metaphor for, for uh, things that are kind of buzzing around as individual threads of control, each with their own set of instructions, and yet they coordinate. So that was one thing. And the second thing is if you look at a beehive, there's all kinds of interesting visual patterns that you see there, right? So the honeycomb pattern, and there's certain properties about the way in which honeycombs are assembled that make them very strong, yet they're flexible, and so on and so forth. So I just kind of like the metaphor of, of autonomous things buzzing around, running concurrently, and somehow communicating with each other uh, in, a, in a, a pattern-like way. That's, that's the reason why. Yeah, Doug. So when I was watching the initial videos, um, it seemed to me that uh, you were suggesting, maybe you weren't suggesting, but it seemed to me that the concurrent literature, the literature on concurrent um, programming was distinct from the literature on network um, system. And that to some extent, your course was trying to synthesize it across and capture some obvious similarities that um, occurred to me while I was watching these two. But are these, in fact, yeah. two different literatures out there? And Great question. To some extent, synthesize it? So, so to repeat the question, the question was, what's the relationship between concurrency and networking? So historically, if you go back you know, to the dawn of time, people have been doing networking for a fairly long time. Because as soon as you got the ability to connect computers together, there were networks going on. The internet goes back to the 70s. And of course, before then, there were proprietary solutions. Um, concurrency has also been going on since the beginning of time. But the ability to have people actually doing programming with concurrency didn't really start to take off in the large till the late 80s, early 90s. You know, There were languages like Ada that were around. I remember when the person asking the question, and I both went to UC Irvine, and uh, they were doing a lot of ADA development back in that time frame. I learned ADA in 1987. Uh, there were concurrency supporting, but it was very clunky, inefficient, hard to work with, ahead of its time, perhaps. Um, so if you look at the literature, there's a huge body of literature on concurrency that ignores networking for the most part. Um, you know, there's lots of computational models, the actor model, um, and so on. Um, not that you can't use those things with network systems, but people tend to look at concurrency, quad concurrency. If you look at programming language support, by and large, you look at things like Java with Java threads. You know, a lot of people just do concurrent programming. And then there's a whole networking literature out there. Historically, the networking people have probably been even lower level in many ways than the concurrency people in terms of their over obsession with low level interfaces and programming with sockets and stuff. So one of the things I realized a long time ago, and this is not unique to me, but realized from a pragmatic point of view is when you start writing concurrent solutions, especially for servers, uh, sorry, when you start writing network solutions, especially for servers, if you want to take maximal effect and benefit of the hardware and the operating system capabilities, you're going to have to end up with some kind of concurrent solutions. So it's really just the, the practical combination of those two things, like peanut butter and chocolate to make a Reese's peanut butter cup. They, they, taste, they taste good in isolation. And when you put them together, they're even tastier. Perhaps not very healthy for you, but they're very tasty. So I don't think there's anything particularly profound. It's just that in the work I've done over the years, most of the problems we were trying to solve had both a networking and a concurrency dimension to them. And um, the patterns are, I, I would say that there's actually more 
patterns that really deal with concurrency than with networking in the course. But that's because once you abstract things properly, the networking dimension sort of disappears. You, you really, if you play your cards right and do a good design, the fact that there's a network is, is abstracted away from in large measure. And it only rears its ugly head when something goes wrong. And hopefully you've structured your programs in a way that you have good support for handling those kinds of errors. More questions? Cool. Yeah. Okay, first, um, there is a request. Could you speak a little bit more slowly? Yeah, I guess. There's, there's no automatic translation going on here, so. Yeah. Um, and. Oh, sorry, Katie. By the way, in terms of speaking slowly, since we're videotaping this, or since it's being recorded, people can go back if they choose later and watch it and slow it down. So that's another trick. People who watch the videos, by the way, can either speed me up, and then I look like I've had 20 cups of coffee, or they can slow me down, in which case it looks like I'm on you know, ether or whatever. Um, so I believe this goes back to yeah. the environments question. Um, so Sean Mulligan asks, I believe you covered this in one of the discussion questions or the videos, but are you going to provide guidance for us getting these environments set up? Yeah, so we'll provide, we'll try as much as we can to provide help for that. Um, obviously, uh, one professor and a TA cannot provide hand-holding for 30,000 people. So you know, that's about as much as I can say there. Fortunately, uh, there are communities for, for the stuff we'll be using that you can avail yourself of. There's also pretty much turnkey solutions. So, and best of all, we have our discussion community forum that can help out. So we'll do the, we'll do the best we can, um, but it's, it's not going to be possible to provide you know, tier one commercial grade technical support like you do if you had a service level agreement with your telecom provider or something like that. Yes? One more. So Doug, would you show actors model? In which language? What about uh, Scala actors? Yeah, so, so, so the question is, has to do with the actors model in uh, Scala. And Scala is a, a programming language that looks suspiciously like Java, but it goes above and beyond with certain types of things, has a syntax very similar to Java's. Uh, it's my understanding that there are some really good programming Coursera courses on, on Scala. Uh, I think Martin Odersky teaches uh, one or more of them. And we're not, we're going to talk about the active object pattern, and we'll talk a lot about different patterns that relate to things that pertain to actors, but we're not going to make actors a big focus of the course. So if you're looking for more information on actors, I strongly recommend taking a look at Martin's course on Scala, and uh, hopefully he's covering the Scala concurrency models there. I think there's other videos you can get, not necessarily Coursera videos, that talk about actors. Um, having said that, we will talk about a lot of the patterns that you would use to make an actors model. And of course, you can realize actors in C++, Java, Scala, many different languages. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm wondering if you're going to cover any of the uh, functional languages uh, in terms of the way that they handle concurrency. One of the things that you hear about is that functional languages sometimes handle it uh -huh. better uh, because they don't have to uh, do a state. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious how, how that fits in. Will we be touching on that in this course? Yep. So the, the question is, will this course be dealing with functional languages? The answer is, is largely no, unless people want to port the slides that are describing the patterns that we'll be covering to those other languages. Um, we'll be focusing predominantly on, on the patterns and frameworks for concurrent network software in the context of Java and C++ and other languages not too far distant from that, like C Sharp right, which is, or Objective-C, which are very, very similar. The, the functional languages is really a, a different paradigm uh, and a very cool paradigm. I've gotten to be more appreciative of functional approaches, ironically, with the work I've done over the last couple of years in the C++ standard template library which is by no means a functional programming language, but the abstractions that STL offers are much more functionally oriented. And it's, it's really cool to program in those formalisms. That isn't the topic of this course, though. But there are definitely going to be courses, if they're not already courses, that cover that. And I think that Scala course I was talking about will give you the flavor of that in the context of Scala. So good, good stuff. Yeah, I think that's, that's another thing, too. Um, one of the tricky parts of, of making any kind of course like this is as much what the course won't cover as what it covers. And I was trying not to get into the space of cool formalisms and languages for you know, cutting edge, next generation, concurrent, or network programming. 
that wasn't the scope. Not that that's not a really important scope. It just wasn't what this course was about. This is more for people who are programming in C++ or Java or C-sharp-ish like languages, want to figure out how to design their systems better. And they don't have the luxury of changing the programming language, but they do have the luxury of changing the design paradigm that they apply. And that's, that's kind of the key thing. In fact, one of the, thing, one of the things I think that we as a, as a discipline, this, this discipline being the software discipline, really have to work better at is how to understand design as design. Um, most people, myself included for many years, came at software design from a programming language-centric point of view. I, I thought about design from the point of view of I know Pascal, or I know Ada, or I know C++, or I know Java. Um, and that's, that's important. The, the danger there is that by taking a language-centric view of things, you miss out on the more universal themes of design that will transcend a particular language. And, and I have a feeling, I'm, I'm not multilingual in my human language, but I have a feeling that people who speak multiple languages probably get a way to look at concepts and cultures in a slightly different way than people who only, only understand it with their one language. And I think the same thing is true about design. If you can understand the fundamentals of design, and I, I talk about this a lot in various videos, it makes you much more recession-proof and future-proof and so on, because as fads come and go, as technologies shift, your understanding of design remains, hopefully remains viable if you've understood it the right way. I, I certainly had that experience many times in my career where I learned the abstractions and it saved me when people changed the operating system, changed the programming language, because I wasn't completely wedded to them, even though I had my personal favorites, of course. Um, you've got to be able to adapt. And that's a, a challenge in our field. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yep. So the, the, the observation slash question, which is a very profound one, is, um, and I bet almost everybody who's listening has this issue, unless you have the luxury of being um, independently wealthy, doing whatever you feel like when you feel like it. Uh, most places you work today don't take a very um, deep view of software and the software craft. It's kind of a you know, time and materials, get it shipped out the door, uh, as soon as it compiles, let, let's get it out there. And, and most places are like that, and there are reasons for that, good reasons and bad reasons. So what do you do, what do you pragmatically do to start to get better um, respect, for lack of a better term, of the profession of design, right? So uh, there are a couple different things you can do. First, you have to, you know, keep in mind, why, do, why are people obsessed about shipping? Because that's where they see the economic value. Can you change the economic value so they also appreciate fewer bugs or faster time to market once you've mastered some design principles or something? You know, in other words, keep talking in their language, but start to substitute the reality in a little bit different way than what they're currently promoting. So, you know, if you go to somebody and you say, "Can we take an extra week to do something or other?" They'll say, "No, we got to ship." If you say, "Can we try to get the bug defect rate down so the customer satisfaction is higher so we spend less time on support calls?" Would you like to do that? Oh, yeah, that, that might be a good idea. So part of it's about the conversation and how you promote these objects. Other things, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit you can leverage, especially with patterns. The great thing about patterns and why I'm such a fan of them is that they can make you more productive almost immediately. Right? So once you absorb even just gang of four level patterns, when you go back to your work and you start to design, if you've taken, you know, if you can woodshed enough time to learn the patterns or watch the videos at 2x, right, you know, so you can do it over the weekend. When you get back to work the next day or the next week, you can actually start to apply those things right away. And, and the way to start is to look for opportunities to refactor what you've already got to some extent. You can also do a lot of this stuff in a very grassroots way. So you can start applying them in your code. Hopefully, if you do it right, you will have the, the benefits that we want, you know, easier to change, less time to market with respect to change. You, know, you might spend an extra day up front doing the abstraction, but then you could get the benefit down the road. Keeping track of those metrics helps. Most people are data-driven, so keeping track of your own personal metrics of productivity can be a very effective thing to do. Uh, another technique that I tend to like to use, because it doesn't require much management buy-in, is to start to do kind of a grassroots, ground bag lunch-like thing. You know, get a couple of other developers who are like-minded, um, you know, do a study group. If, if you watch, by the way, one of the cool things when you look at the, the online discussion forum is how quickly discussion groups just form instantly around the world. And 
half the time I can't figure out what they're saying because it's in their language. But you could form a discussion group or study group at work. You know, if, if you really want to go out on a limb, get your boss to buy you lunch on Fridays and uh, have people get together and take turns presenting a pattern, like a brown bag lunch, and each week take a gang of four pattern or watch a video from the videos here, and then have people get together and talk about how do we use this pattern in our design, right? So every step along the way, it's in terms of something that makes them, you know, it's not just about academic ivory tower, pie in the sky, let's think about this in 10 years. It's like, how do we refactor our code? We've got a new release coming out in six months. What can we do now from a design point of view? And I think very quickly, when you start to give a name to these things, people start to think it's kind of cool. And if you play your cards right, you get support and you know, management buy-in can follow. Now, obviously, if you want to start transforming the whole culture of the company, that takes more buy-in. But you can do an awful lot of things pretty grassroots, in my experience. Uh, that that's another good example. So this is great. So, uh, yeah. so one of the questions is, what are the artifacts that you produce from design? So, so obviously, um, uh, ultimately, the design is manifest in the source code that you write. Right? That's, that's the projection of something which could have come from a person's head or could come from a UML diagram or whatever into the code. So, so there's a very tight correlation between the design artifact and the code ultimately. How you get that code is the issue. So one thing you can do, and I, I love to do this, take the, people have a tendency to love to draw UML diagrams. Right? Those can get a little tedious after a while. But what you can do is you can use some of the UML notation to go through and annotate the parts of the design that play the roles of certain patterns. And if you take a look, for example, in, in this week's lecture that came out yesterday, there's a section in there, I think it's the, the second video or maybe the third video on overview of patterns. And it talks about the observer pattern. And it illustrates the observer pattern, and then it shows the mapping of the observer pattern into a couple different things in Android. And if you look at those slides, it shows how you represent in UML what those classes, what role the classes play in those patterns. So a very fun exercise to do is to take some software you've already got or a design that you've already got and mark it up using UML pattern notation to start to see where you're already using this stuff. Because one of the things, I see these on comments on the message board all the time, people say stuff like, you know, I knew about this stuff, I just didn't know what to call it. You know, so a lot of this is about codification. And if you can convince people they already know this, they just have to come up with a common terminology, you're halfway there, right? Because um, it lowers the barrier to entry. So yeah, design artifacts are UML diagrams, interface descriptions, and then of course when you start writing code, they're your, your class interfaces, your class dependencies, the interactions, the associations, and so on, as, as manifest in the source code. That's another yeah. question. Um, Kevin, been still a little confused about the need to understand C++ and Java. I am a Java programmer, but my understanding is that there are ACE assignments, C++. How does that work? Could you address? Sure. So the question is, uh, what's the relationship between Java and C++? So, so there's, uh, and, and we'll be beginning assignments in particular technology families alone. No. Uh, the assignments we're going to give are always going to be implementable either in C++ or Java. Um, having said that, a lot of the material uses C++. Actually, a lot of the intro material uses Java because it was easier to talk about the, the concepts in Java for the first six hours worth of video. So you see lots and lots of Java examples. Um, for some of the stuff, if this is kind of fun, when you go and look at the appendix material, the Gang of Four videos, when I had first started filming them, my intent was to show C++ versions and Java versions side by side for each of the patterns we were describing. After about the first video, I realized that the C++ implementation was essentially identical to the Java implementation, and people would rip their, their eyes out if they had to watch me show a Java and a C++ version for everything, because they were almost exactly the same, illustrating the power of patterns, right? Because very little things change, it's just the implementation. So all those videos, you could, you could replace C++ with Java without missing a beat. Um, when we start getting into the concurrency and networking dimensions, you've got to be a bit more concrete. Java has lots of cool stuff out of the box that people recognize from documentation that is concurrent and networked. So there's a lot of examples in Java. Uh, we use C++ for the Section 3 stuff because we're showing frameworks. And I need to be able to talk very specifically about how those frameworks could be realized in something concrete. So those tend to be in C++ using ACE. But all the, all the programming assignments, it's your choice. You can, use, you can use C++, you can use with ACE, you can use Java with Android, or just Java with Java. As we were just talking about, if we get our act together, you can use C Sharp. 
the assignments will be written in terms of realizing certain design patterns to accomplish some capability. The fact that you write in C++ with ACE or Java or C Sharp, as long as you can realize the pattern, that's what's important. Now, keep in mind again, choose a language where there's actually a community of people who can peer grade it. If you pick um, Jovial or some other esoteric language that, that nobody still knows, uh, it's like you know speaking Cherokee wind talking or something. There's not going to be a lot of people out there who can evaluate what you're doing because they won't be able to understand what you're doing. And now I'm talking way too fast. Um, okay, yes, that was another request to go down for our non-native speakers <laughs> in the yeah. audience. Um, again, um, and this is a question about, we've been talking about designing and patterns. Well, that's very important while you're writing code. But we're here to build applications that take advantages of the middleware, right? Are we going to discuss various middlewares in Java and Android? That's fine. OK, so I think, I think the question is, and it's similar to a question we had earlier, um, what is the split in the course between learning patterns and frameworks to build infrastructure versus using patterns and frameworks to build applications on top of infrastructure. And so you'll see this, this, this actually becomes very pronounced as we get further on into section two, which is what we're on right now. So the, the gang of four material that we're about to talk about, which will start next week, the gang of four patterns in the next section, we present four patterns, uh, proxy, broker, command, processor, command pattern, and the observer pattern. Um, all those patterns can be used in different ways. If you are developing an application, you will need to know, probably need to know the observer pattern. Uh, so that's uh, it's, a, it's a design pattern that can be applied to build middleware or infrastructure. It can also be used to build applications. So it's a very wide spectrum, dual purpose pattern. The particular example I'm going to give is in the context of uh, Android and the way its broadcast receiver framework works. But if you're an application developer in Android, you have to learn how to use broadcast receivers. So that's really an application. It's a pattern that's applied for applications, but is used to build system infrastructure for applications. Uh, in the case of the broker, we're going to look at some examples. We're not going to talk about how you, we're not going to talk in next week's section about how you build a broker. We're going to talk about how you would use a broker, the broker pattern, in order to build an application, in this case, the download uh, videos or, or other files in Android. So that's an application use of a pattern. Uh, proxy, again, we're not going to talk so much about how you implement proxy, although we'll talk just a tiny bit about it. But the main point is how do you use the proxy pattern to build applications that can talk across address spaces without being concerned for issues like um, uh, byte order or marshalling or demultiplexing, etc. And then the command pattern is another application pattern for moving things from one address space to another. Uh, we're going to use Android's intent service as an example of this, which is another framework level capability. It's part of the service uh, framework component in Android that you use to build concurrent multi-threaded applications. So a lot of these, the point here is that a lot of these patterns have multiple dual purposes. You can use them for infrastructure. You can use them for applications. Some you would only use for infrastructure. Some you would only use for applications. But that's a vanishingly tiny number of things. Uh, most of this stuff, you'll see very quickly, can be applied many, many, many different places. Um, now, if, if you're programming entirely in some kind of you know, fourth or fifth generation scripting language, some of these patterns won't be applicable because they're, they're too far away from what you would be doing. Um, but a lot of stuff, when the minute you start talking about concurrency and networking, you're into the space in which a lot of these things apply. And can you talk about Scala? Scala. So Scala is a, is a programming language that's very popular these days, or becoming more popular. Um, and it's, it kind of has a Java look and feel to it. I think in some ways, this is, this is probably the wrong metaphor, but uh, people will not like this metaphor, but I'll use it anyway. So Scala is to Java the way that C++ is to C. So if you were a C developer, you sort of knew what, if you were a C developer, you knew what C was. If you were a C++ developer coming from C, it was an easy transition because it had similar syntax. Uh, Scala is something that is got a Java-like look to it, but it goes further to add functional programming support and some interesting concurrency model mechanisms based on the actor's model. And take a look. I'll give you a plug for Martin Odursky's course on Scala, which is a Coursera course. So if you want to know Scala, that's a good place to go. We are not going to talk about Scala 
other than if people want to port the, the slides over to Scala. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. It's Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Uh, so, so in section two, there's about six hours worth of material in section two. I would say there's probably an hour and a half of frameworks and four and a half hours on patterns, and and that's deliberate uh, for for somewhat of the reasons that you're talking about. The, the question was the split between focus on patterns and the focus on frameworks. Patterns are more fundamental, right? You don't have to commit yourself as deeply to a programming language, to a particular platform, to a source code. Uh, you're talking about design. Having said that, uh, in my experience, patterns in isolation are great. They, they make you a better designer. They make you able to communicate yourself more effectively. They make you more fun at parties. Okay, maybe not. Um, depends what kind of parties you go to. <clears throat> but they don't make you more productive in quite the way that you need to be to satisfy the discussions about shipping code tomorrow, right? So that, that means we've got to do some other kind of systematic you know, productivity boost. And so uh, mod, starting with module 5 and then continuing into module 6 in section 2, we'll start talking about frameworks. And we'll also compare and contrast frameworks with other productivity boosting techniques, such as class libraries, which are kind of the, the classic way of doing these things going back to the 80s, um, service-oriented architectures, component-based solutions, which are sort of more, more recent ways of doing things. Um, frameworks are kind of this interesting middle ground. And then section three of the course is where we go really into frameworks and show very specific detailed examples. But all the framework discussions will be motivated and guided by patterns. So we'll be talking a lot about ACE, we'll be talking about stuff with, with Android and so on, but the patterns we'll be describing transcend those particular environments. I just had to find something I could talk about concretely that I actually knew something about, um, but the patterns are the, are the focus. So you know, patterns lead and frameworks follow, which is probably the right mix, because I'm completely aware that when all is said and done, you may or may not choose the same frameworks that I chose. Um, you will probably choose many of the same patterns. But rather than just talk in ethereal ways about patterns and burn incense or something like that, which would be confusing, we've we got to be concrete. And so I pick examples that are things you would likely run across. And the good news is, again, Android, almost everything that we'll talk about in ACE and C++ has a similar corollary in Java and Android. I mean, it's really kind of cool. And that's sort of the theme. Um, and if we really were to go uh, to where I hope we get by the time we're done, you'll see that many of the same patterns we'll describe in C++ are for, for our web. The, the final section three of the course is all about a web server. That we're we're dry, using a web server to drive the discussion. And we look at about, like I said, eight different paths to a pattern language for doing high performance concurrent solutions. And we look at different trade-offs. And so patterns are leading every step along the way. And then when we want to be concrete, we say, here's how you implement this pattern. Here's what it looks like in ACE. Here's how it looks like in, in Java, Android. So now you have something concrete to hang your hat on. But the key theme is the pattern language discussion. The frameworks are there just to keep it grounded, keep it from being irrelevant and ethereal. Yes? We have a few more okay. online questions. I don't know if you want to those last online questions. How do you want to do that? But okay. Our first question is, do you think join from Qualcomm is relevant here. It does services in peer discovery very efficiently. It's platform and transport port agnostic. Ah, uh, that's something I'm so Alidjoin, That's something I'm not really familiar with. Uh, why not, for the person who asked that question, why don't you post something which I can take a look at later, and we can have a discussion on the discussion forum or in a subsequent one of these groups. Post a, a link to it, and I'll take a look. Um, I, I have done work with Qualcomm in the past on Brew which is quite a fascinating um, mobile programming environment for mobile phones, which is full of patterns uh, written in C. So it's kind of an interesting example of how people who really want to put their mind to it can do some cool things with C if they know the patterns. And there's lots of good patterns in Qualcomm uh, Brew. OK, one last yeah. online question. So 
would you show cross-language IPC, for example, between C++ and Java using, using Apache Script or a straightforward broker implementation? Oh, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, again, starting next, next week's or end of this week's videos on the Gang of Four patterns, we're going to talk about the broker pattern. And uh, I'll show I'll, the broker pattern discussion I will focus on, just to make it fun, is the binder mechanism, binder framework in Android. And as you'll see when, we, when you go through the videos, the binder framework in Android uh, can be accessed from multiple languages. There's a Java binding to the binder. And then you can also have C and C++ bindings to the binder. And the whole, the whole uh, way in which interlanguage interoperability works is by using proxies to go back and forth between whatever native language you're in and a language independent way of passing messages across between address spaces using the binder, uh, the binder driver and the AIDL mechanism, which we'll talk about in the video. Uh, and then you can have those mappings to C++, C, Java, conceivably other languages too. So it's the combination of the proxy pattern with the broker pattern that makes it straightforward in order to be able to get that inter language interoperability. And, and yes, we will talk at, at, at length about that. Um, and I'll also be providing lots of links to other places for further information. And the great thing about Android uh, in this context is it's all open source. So you can go and look at it. I will look. I will show in the descriptions in the videos a little bit of the inner workings of how proxies work on Android. The minute you see how they work, you will realize why you want them to be auto-generated, because they are ugly. Uh, but that's the point. By using the pattern, you focus on something that looks and feels like you're making a method call on a normal, uh, a normal standalone method in a standalone environment. But under the hood, the binder mechanisms and the broker pattern are being used to ship the data across the address spaces. So uh, you'll get lots and lots of discussions about cross-language, patterns for cross-language interoperability. That can be mapped to your favorite technology of choice, whether it be an app server or some kind of component middleware or service-oriented architecture or you know, WebSphere, WebLogic, you know, Apache Tomcat, and so on. Yes, sir? So are there higher order Oh, great question. So the question is, are there higher order patterns? Yes, there are. And you should take a look if you really want to see an interesting discussion. And I've got to slow down. <laughs> not, not so fast. Uh, the question was, are there higher order patterns? And one nice place to look is a book written in the mid-90s by Wolfgang Pre called Meta Patterns. And his, his basic thesis, that what he was coming from, was if you look at the Gang of Four book, which was the primary reference available in patterns at that time, there are 23 patterns in the Gang of Four book. If you step back and look at it carefully, he broke it down, I think, to two meta patterns that the other ones derive from. And um, it, absolutely, if you take a look at the other books that I've written or other people have written, there's different ways of classifying patterns. So the, the Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture Volume 4 book, POSA 4, which has the pattern language for distributed computing in it, we broke it down to, I think it was 13 or 14 different categories of patterns, concurrency patterns, you know, patterns for um, you know, coordination, patterns for uh, distribution, and so on. So yes, there are definitely ways of categorizing patterns at a higher level. Um, you could also think about this in much the same way that people think about, you know, sorting, right? If you're a, if you're an algorithmist, you, cat, you classify sorting algorithms into at least two classes. You have comparison and exchange sorts and divide and conquer sorts, right? And and the world breaks down, and there's all kinds of theorems about the best complexity you can get with a comparison and exchange sort and so on. You can do very similar kinds of things to patterns. Um, and you can look at patterns in terms of their the binding time at which they bind their variations to concrete instantiations. So to make that a little bit more concrete, we'll talk about this a lot later. Good example, the strategy pattern and the template method pattern. These are two gang of four patterns. They give you alternative ways to do more or less the same thing, which is to vary your algorithm, your codes, in selective ways. The strategy pattern is more of a composition-based pattern. In fact, you'll see when you take a look at the Gang of Four videos, I have a whole explanation with a case study to show this. The strategy pattern can be implemented, for example, with parameterized types, where you do very eager binding, or earlier binding, of the variabilities. 
The template method pattern uses subclassing and dynamic binding. So it's a later binding mechanism. And so those are alternative ways of thinking about composition and variability. So the, yes, there's many, many different ways to look at those conceptually. And a good place to look for that stuff um, is the POSA 5 book, which is about pattern languages. Probably my, my very favorite topic in the course, the people sometimes say, well, don't we already know all this stuff? Well, some stuff you probably already do know, like gang of four patterns. Other stuff you probably don't know at all because it's not been widely discussed in the mainstream computer software literature. Pattern languages are the thing. So the idea of having you know, alternative paths to navigate through a design space, each with well understood systematic trade-offs and applicability, that is something that most people don't know. To the extent that they know it, it's intuitive. It's based on their experience, but they've never taken the time to formalize it. And you will see example after example, once we get into the course a bit more, of how we have pattern languages to represent the design space, and then how you use those pattern languages to navigate to come up with different solutions that meet different requirements. And I think that is just the coolest thing, because when you finally get it, when you get all the pieces in place for the patterns in the pattern language, your ability as an architect as a lead developer to organize your team to solve hard problems goes way up. Because now you can have a conversation about software at the design level, and yet, to quote our good friend Ed Dijkstra, you can still be very precise. So it allows you to be able to talk about the trade-off. So once, we, once you understand strategy versus template method, or once you understand half sync, half async versus leader followers versus reactor versus active object, which are all concurrency patterns, you can have a conversation with your team members who are trying to build some high performance server. And you can say, let's figure out what are our requirements? What are our constraints? What are our customers expect us to do? What's our ability as a team? What language are we programming in? And based on the answers to those questions, the pattern language will guide you like a Ouija board through the space of design. And you'll come up with something. And you can actually know well ahead of time before you start writing code what the consequences of your designs will be. So there's a whole discussion Section Module 4 in Part 2 of the course, which will probably be two weeks from now, goes into detail about these different types of pattern relationships. And we'll talk about a lot of things in that case. I think that'll be really interesting to people. And that the trade-offs between design. That's, that's the thing that I think is often most missing in the way that we talk as software professionals. People have a hard time explaining design as design. And what they do is they fall back to programming language stuff. So a, a classic example, the observer pattern, right? Observer pattern is a pattern that helps have a one-to-many mapping where something changes, multiple observers are notified. Once you understand the basic pattern, you can talk to people who understand it. You, you communicate almost instantly. If you don't understand the observer pattern, you are reduced to saying things like, remember that time we had a linked list of callback functions? No, wait, no. It was an array of pointers to base classes with virtual functions. No, 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 no. It was, a, it was an RPC mechanism that talked you've lost everybody in the room. If they don't know that exact design, they don't understand what you're talking about because you're forced to talk in very low-level ways. When you understand observer, you say, ah, oh, we have to have some kind of you know, change propagation mechanism. Why don't we see if the observer makes sense? And everybody who knows the observer, bing, the lights go off. Now, to go back to your point, when you're in that design discussion and someone says, what are you talking about? What's this observer stuff? I never heard of observer. What do you do? You say, Here's the book. Come to our brown bag lunch next Friday, and we'll talk about it, right? And then they can argue with you know the gang of four, and not you, right? I've actually found uh, this this doesn't work very long, but um, anybody who has young kids knows that there's a certain age where you can get them to go along with you by saying you know something like because I said so, right? And then they get to be about three, and that doesn't work very long, right? So there's a certain point in an organization where your knowledge of patterns means that you'll always win the design argument because you can appeal to the patterns. You know, you're arguing with someone about design, you're like, yeah, but look, Gang of Four says observer. I'm like, oh, OK, Gang of Four says. And that lasts about a month, right? And then they go and they read the book. And now they're going to that's not the right. It's a mediator, damn it, not an observer. OK, well, you've already won. The minute that they're talking to you about the patterns in the Gang of Four book, they're already come over to your side, right? And by being able to point to things that are well documented it makes it much easier to you know, not only win by authority, but actually have something to back up the rationale for the design. 
that's the other key theme in the course, and this sometimes is not well understood by our profession either. Um, it's not enough to show people a diagram that says what you're doing. You want to be able to show people something that says why you're doing it. And a UML diagram or any, any kind of documentation does a pretty good job with the what, sometimes too much of the how, but it never tells you the why. Patterns help to tell you the why. And that's why if you understand the UML documentation form for patterns, now you show a design, and rather than just saying, here's my UML diagram, do you love it? You can say, here's my UML diagram, and notice how this class plays the role of the, the observer in the observer pattern. This role plays the role of the event handler in the reactor pattern. Notice by putting a reactor at the bottom and an observer on top, we can take information flowing in from a network source, be able to demultiplex it, and dispatch it to multiple subscribers where, who can filter on the type of data. <laughs> Now, now you can see what, <laughs> well, you can win those arguments, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the, the trick is to get other people to realize that thinking a little bit more abstractly is not going to kill them, right? Um, most people, especially people who build embedded systems, have a deep suspicion of abstraction uh, because they, they've or have been taught that abstraction makes things slow, it makes things big, it makes things confusing. And that's usually true if they don't pick the right technologies, number one, but also if they don't understand the patterns of effective use. And, and that's the key thing. I think our, we're, we're going to get there, but it's going to take a while. When people start to think in terms of these design abstractions and then map them to the language features, that's a very powerful combination. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to stop the video now. We don't have to stop the discussion here, but I think we want to have some chit-chat and networking, and that won't lend itself very well. I, I want to thank everybody who showed up from around the world. Um, I know it's probably crazy time zones in other places in Europe. It's probably now uh, about midnight. In, I don't even want to think about what time it is in India, probably 4 in the morning or something like that, or China or anywhere else. But we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And we'll continue these discussions on the message boards. And uh, I hope you got something from the discussion. And remember, you can go back and, and re-watch the archive version, and you can slow me down. <laughs>